And when I said, do it privately, just with the two of you and the best man, so nobody would know, and that's it. And then she told me, I would feel so sorry to get married without anybody from Boschko's side of the family. Meanwhile, the war was taking a terrible toll on Admira's family. Her favorite cousin, Brana, the mother of two boys, had lost her husband before the war, and then she was killed by a 60 millimeter shell while putting her sons to bed. The boys were so traumatized by witnessing their mother's death, they refused to leave the courtyard of their apartment building. Boshko and Admira soon became surrogate parents for the two orphans. I knew Boshko and Admira almost from the day I was born. They took me everywhere. Admira was here on my birthday. She brought me books. The last time she gave me three books. Before that, she gave me six. She was bringing me different books all the time. And she brought us chocolate that Boshko got from the army. Admira took toys to them. She knitted sweaters, made slippers for them, anything to make them happy. It's war. They're not able to buy anything, no stores. It's only what you can find on the black market. If somebody is selling something, it was hard to find anything, but they would constantly go there. They loved those kids so much. The first winter of the war hit Sarajevo hard. The city had been without power or running water for months. Its citizens were forced to make long, dangerous treks to the few public water supplies scattered throughout the city. Muslims, Croats and Serbs were drawn together by the daily struggle for survival. On Kosovo Hill, Jurka Radojevic, a Serbian neighbor, relied on the young couple who lived downstairs. Bosko carried water to me all last winter. It was only rarely that he couldn't do it, but... Nobody had electricity. They didn't have any, and I didn't have any. We helped each other, because I had an old wood stove, which I'd found in a burned-down house, and we baked bread in it together. We always shared every piece of bread. The winter was unusually harsh, and across the city, a desperate population scrounged for fuel wherever it could be found. But the young man on Kosovo Hill remained generous. He never did anything bad to anybody. He was always coming with a kilo of flour or rice to try to help out, but he never came to your door to take something. A bag of rice or flour now cost a small fortune in a city where people were forced to use a bunch of weeds to stave off starvation for days. Sarajevo was now completely dependent on the United Nations relief flights for food and medicine. To supplement these meager rations, Sarajevans relied on the black market that flourished thanks to corrupt soldiers serving in UNPROFOR, the United Nations peacekeeping force. Coffee, cigarettes and gasoline stolen from UNPROFOR depots appeared on the black market at 10 or 20 times their original value. Unable to operate his store any longer, Boschko, like many other Sarajevans, became an operator in the black market. Misha Chuk was his partner, but was reluctant to admit the extent of their illegal business. 
You have to make money to live. It wasn't so much petrol, but coffee and things like that. You can't tell me that it's not petrol and diesel. Yes, it was that too. It was a dirty job, but it was better with stuff like that. And Cello told us we could do that. Cello told us you were dealing in petrol and diesel the whole war. Yes, yes, sir. Cello told us we could do that. Petrol. They were dealing in petrol with Unperfor. You know what a good business it is dealing with Unperfor? You take one ton of petrol at night and sell it by next morning, so you're ahead two or three thousand Dutch marks, even more. Misha and Bashko were inseparable. He was with them all the time. He would come here and he was in their apartment all the time also. Bashko felt badly for him. His mother was gone, his wife was gone and he was all alone, so he brought him home very often for lunch. And he spent evenings in their place. So during this war they were inseparable. In the spring of 1993, as the war entered its second year, Misha Chuk was a desperate man. In late April, he volunteered to drive Boshko and Admira from Kosovo Hill to a wedding in central Sarajevo. In a lavish ceremony, Cello was getting married. Generals, cabinet ministers, all of Sarajevo's elite was there. Boshko and Admira were honored to be invited. But as they celebrated, Misha Chuk was disappearing, fleeing out of Sarajevo, carrying with him a gun, a two-way radio, and secret military codes from his unit in the Bosnian army. He had told Boshko nothing. He put Boshko in a very grave situation. I would never do that to a friend. I don't know if he thought about that or how deep or strong that friendship was, but I could never do that to a friend. It's very unpleasant if you and I are friends and then you leave me here and go to the other side. This is war. People shooting, people dying. Misha should have thought about what would happen, but Misha didn't think anymore. It's terrible, Misha's mistake. Misha's mistake would cost Boshko and Admira dearly. In April of 1993, the Western powers were debating whether airstrikes or military intervention could bring a halt to the siege of Sarajevo. Misha was now with his wife and children in Serbia-controlled Bosnia, while Boshko remained behind to face the consequences of his friend's desertion. So when Misha did that shit, I mean escaping, then the pressure on Boshko started. Some guys in our army started to attack him, even sometimes physically. One of them threw a rock at him, and so I had to protect him again. If I hadn't protected him, they would have killed him. He'd disappear. The neighborhood reacted in a very ugly way, because Misha had a reputation there as commander of Kosovo Hill. And then the commander flees to the other side. So they had the urge to retaliate against somebody connected to Misha. But Misha had nobody there except them. So they turned against them because they were the people who spent time with Misha. He knew they weren't ever separated. They were together all winter. And then when they found out that Misha had escaped, they started to talk differently about Bosco. Here in the neighborhood? Yes. 
Yes. They started to say that he was a Chetnik, that he should be in jail. 